Today on Investigate TV Plus, a mother says a simple piece of tech in her car could have saved her son's life. I just feel like, dang, if we would have just had that, you know? We reveal the fight to make this safety system mandatory in all vehicles. This is beyond urgent. Plus, surprise symptoms. I was having pain in my lower back, my upper back. I was having bad migraines. Reveal a bigger issue. How this student school nurse was able to diagnose a serious disease and an in-depth look at a potential health care solution for parents. Then, this couple's journey to parenthood wasn't an easy one. All anatomy scans and everything looked great. It wasn't until after he was born that um, they heard a murmur. How the birth of their baby led to their true calling in life. So grateful for what our family looks like. And it looks wildly different than we would have ever <laughs> planned, but it's better. In-depth stories that inform and inspire. You're watching Investigate TV Plus. A big change to new cars across the U.S. could help keep your children safe. I'm T. Chappelle. And I'm Lee Zurich, though some safety advocates say it's long overdue. You've probably heard that sound or something similar when you get behind the wheel of a car. It's a seatbelt warning system and a reminder to buckle up. Those reminders have been required in driver's seats for decades. But there's no such mandate when it comes to the back seat, where children often end up sitting and where seatbelt use is said to reduce the risk of fatality for rear seat occupants by 55% in cars, 74% in light trucks and vans. Now the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration is eyeing a potentially life-saving update. Reporter Heather Graff explains the proposal to expand seatbelt warning systems in cars. Plus a mother shares her nightmare as a reminder of what's at stake. Very boisterous, very outdoorsy, very outgoing. There are simply not enough words for Rosalind Darby to describe him. You know, he was kind of a jewel to me. Because her son Calvin was one of a kind. And their time together yeah. was far too short. I mean, it's hard. It was August of 2007, a vacation and a road trip for their family of six. I drove maybe half a block and I said, Calvin, do you have your seatbelt on? And he said, I don't think he said anything. I think he just sighed and we pulled over and heard the click. And so we went on our way. What Rosalind didn't know is that Calvin later unbuckled as they drove through rural Idaho. And this image of their mangled SUV shows you what happened next. I knew that he had passed away when we crashed. 12 year old Calvin was the only fatality and the only one not wearing a seat belt. A three and a five year old in the rear and then a 12 year old and 11 month old in the middle and two adults in the front and everybody that was buckled lived. The seat belts saved their lives. And still, my son would be 28. All these years later, Rosalind can't help but think this sound might have kept Calvin safe. I just feel like, dang, if we would have just had that, you know? She's talking about seatbelt warning systems, featuring visual and audible alerts that activate when a belt is not fastened. The reminders currently required only in driver's seats under federal motor vehicle safety standards that date back to the 1970s. Seatbelts are really the first line of defense when you're in a crash to protect you, and but not enough people are buckling up. Kathy Chase leads the group known as Advocates for Highway and Auto Safety that's long been pushing to expand seatbelt warning systems to all seating positions, citing statistics that show the impact of belt use. For instance, in 2021, about 26,000 passenger vehicle occupants lost their lives on U.S. roads. And among those crashes in which restraint status is known, 57% of rear seat fatalities were unbelted. You know, we have in our cars, we have reminders if the trunk is open or the skylight is still open or your gas tank is running low. But there's no reminder for the passenger side or anyone in the rear seats 
to buckle up. This is beyond urgent. Other countries are already requiring this? The European Union has required belt reminders for all passengers since 2019. What does that say to you? We're behind. We could be saving lives that we're not. In fact, Congress, way back in 2012, directed the U.S. Department of Transportation's National Highway Traffic Safety Administration to begin what's known as a rulemaking to mandate those seatbelt reminders for back seats. But more than a decade later, it still hasn't happened. It's dependent upon the leadership of the U.S. Department of Transportation, which of course changes from administration to administration. And while many automakers have voluntarily added seatbelt warning systems for their front passenger seat, data from NHTSA indicates just 47 percent of new cars feature those same reminders in the back. This, as the National Occupant Protection Use Survey shows seatbelt use for years, has been lower in the rear seat than the front. It's beyond frustrating. It's tragic. Then, in August of 2023, a significant step forward. NHTSA finally announced a proposed rule that would require automobile manufacturers to equip vehicles with seatbelt use warning systems for the right front passenger and rear seats as well. The agency estimates the changes would prevent approximately 300 non-fatal injuries and over 100 fatalities every year. But NHTSA is still reviewing public comments, and it's not yet a done deal. I guess I would just say, what are you waiting on? Is Calvin not worth it? Um, is the next child not worth it? We took Rosalind's question to Capitol Hill, where Representative Jan Schakowsky of Illinois chairs the U.S. House Subcommittee on Consumer Protection. We have to do better, and NHTSA, this agency, has to speed up. What else can Congress do to ensure that this time NHTSA actually gets it done? This legislation that, that we have passed is in general, bipartisan, Republicans and Democrats. So what we need to do, we set a fire under NHTSA. You've got to get to work and just get it done and get it implemented. NHTSA, meanwhile, declined our request for an interview and when asked about the timeline for implementation, referred us back to its 232-page proposal that suggests the expanded seatbelt warning requirements be rolled out in stages with automakers expected to comply about one to two years after publication of the final rule. Gosh, it could really be easily fixed. It really could be. From Rosalind's perspective, it's a simple solution to help protect our most precious cargo. A lot of times kids lay down and they get comfortable or they unbuckle and they reach over and they get their blanket or they get their binky, Nintendo Switch, whatever it is. It happened to her son. Just imagine, you know. And it could happen to anyone. Losing a child, it just devastates an entire family. Reporter Heather Graff joins us now. Heather, do we know how much money it would take to implement these expanded seatbelt warning systems in new cars? Lee, NHTSA's proposal does include a cost estimate, and to comply with the new rear seatbelt warning requirements, it says automakers would spend about $166 million. Now, that might sound like a lot, but get this, it comes out to less than $20 per vehicle. And in the passenger seat, where the technology is already common, the cost assessment is just $2.13 per vehicle. And what about automakers? What are they saying about all of this? Well, we reached out to the Alliance for Automotive Innovation that represents automakers who told us safety is the auto industry's top priority. The group submitted public comment on seatbelt warning systems to NHTSA and wrote that in general, auto innovators support NHTSA's efforts to expand them. But the Alliance did express concerns that some of the proposed requirements differ from those currently in place in Europe. And they asked NHTSA to make changes so that U.S. regulations better align with global markets. Still ahead on Investigate TV Plus, they're the same tools we use in our investigations. And now we want to share them with you. We trust them with some of our biggest life decisions, but do you really know your doctor? How you can be your own investigator to check on your doctor before your next checkup. 
Plus, no more doctor's notes. We're able to see kids for well visits, sports physicals, you know, work permits, all those teenage things, as well as sick visits. How some school campuses across the U.S. are becoming one-stop shops for student health. At this school in Cleveland Heights, Ohio, this isn't your ordinary nurse's office. Is that first base in the district that really has this full quote unquote doctor's office right in the school building. But the concept of school-based health centers have been around for a while. According to a study from the Office of the U.S. Surgeon General, one in 10 children in public schools is medically underserved because of a lack of health insurance or access to health care, helping kids get ahead of the curve when it comes to wellness. I think this is gonna be the new healthcare system nationwide after a point because it's really providing access to kids who wouldn't otherwise have it. The researchers in the Surgeon General study concluded school health programs along with community care can quote, offer an opportunity to improve a child's health in a way that is unparalleled in public health history. Reporter Tiffany Tucker shows us how school-based healthcare can be a lifeline for some families. Overwhelmed, tired. Single mom of four, Erica tallies like many parents who sometimes face challenges just trying to raise their children. But for this Warren mom, a recent health challenge made everyday life even tougher. Took out all of my hair, turned my skin dark and my skin and my nails and my feet, made me very weak, had sores in my mouth and my nose. I went through a lot of transactions. Erica diagnosed with gastrointestinal cancer more than a year ago. She underwent six months of chemotherapy. Couldn't drive, I couldn't do anything. Erica's daughter, Janiah, wanted to get a job to help out with the bills. In order to do that, she needed a work permit and a physical. But with her mom's illness, she knew she couldn't take her or her three other siblings to the pediatrician. But she knew there was a solution to the problem her school could help out. She brought home this paper. She said, we have a nurse. We're able to see kids for well visits, sports physicals, you know, work permits, all those teenage things, as well as sick visits, um, you know, kindergartners who needed vaccines and weren't able to get in um, with their primary care provider. Nurse practitioner Allison Lance oversees Akron Children's Hospital's school-based health center in Warren City Schools. The district contracts the services with the hospital. The program is in 14 school districts and more than 100 school buildings across northern Ohio. Allison and RNs are employed by the hospital. Allison was able to do Janiah's um, physical her, for her work permit. She was able to get her job and she's been working that job ever since. Stick that tongue out for me, say ah. Allison able to provide screenings and physicals for all of Erica's children. But when she was looking over her youngest son Jonathan's health history, something didn't seem right. I was having pain in my lower back, my upper back. I was having bad migraines. This lab work looks to me like sickle cell disease. And so within 10 minutes, I was able to call mom back and say, the hematologist really does believe that this is sickle cell disease. It's, it's all amazing, especially being that she was able to find the sickle cell crisis with my son that I never was told about when he was a baby. Allison's also able to communicate with her medical assistant with their school telehealth system. The assistant goes to other campuses, sometimes seeing more than a dozen students a day. Via computer, the two can exchange medical information. I'm grateful for them bringing this program to the school. Grateful. Erica Talley says knowing her children's education and health care needs are taken care of. Grateful that she's now cancer free. Still ahead, fostering a loving environment. When you look at a kid that has disability, you see the disability, you see the challenges, but you don't see all of the really great things that that kid can bring. How this family's open arms welcome some of our most fragile children. Plus, getting the T on your MD. They make important decisions about your life. We'll show you how you can be your own investigator and the simple tools to get the details on your doctor's qualifications. When it comes to doctors, we put our lives in their hands to make the best decisions 
for our health. Reporter Josie Sturman shows us how you can be your own investigator to make sure that you and your family get the best care possible. You trust them with your life, but what do you really know about the doctors who help to make your major health decisions and also handle your surgeries? In this Be Your Own Investigator, we'll tell you some ideas to get the deets on your doctor before you visit the office or go under the knife using the same tools we've used in our own investigations. Every single state in the U.S. has a medical board that licenses and oversees doctors. In almost every state, they've got information online about individual physicians, from where they went to college to whether they're their board certified in a certain specialty. The easiest way to find it is to Google your state and doctor license lookup. That should get you to your medical board page to look up the physicians. From there, you can usually just type in your doctor's name and you should get a whole profile page that gives background on the person who is poking and prodding you. For instance, in Texas, the online doctor profiles from their medical board list everything from how long they've been practicing to where they have hospital privileges, even if they've paid out malpractice payments. Speaking of malpractice, when things go wrong and doctors end up in hot water, that's often public record too. But doctor discipline records can be harder to find. Action taken by the medical board should appear on a doctor's profile page, but in some places the medical board lists recent discipline right on their homepage so you can see it without individually searching. State laws typically dictate how much information they're going to give the public when a doctor's license is suspended or even worse, revoked. So what you get depends on where you live. Sometimes, like in Kentucky or Tennessee, you can download a document that has the whole story about what landed the doctor in trouble. Other states simply tell you some form of action was taken and leave you wondering. Keep in mind, your doc may have moved during their career, and if you want to see if they've had problems somewhere else, you can check doctor records nationwide through a site called docinfo.org. That's run by the Federation of State Medical Boards, which puts the information for every state all in one place. So hit the web and check out your doc before your next checkup. With this Be Your Own Investigator, I'm Josie Sturman. Still ahead on Investigate TV Plus, when it comes to foster families, the stay may be temporary, but the love is permanent. A lot of people ask us how we can do it, and I think some of it is just because we choose to. How this couple found their calling fostering children with special needs. A safe and loving home. To take a kid that just would have nothing and now he's he got everything. I love them. Something that can be taken for granted. We have a huge need for foster families here um, because we've got a lot of kids um, bouncing between homes. There are 391,000 children in the foster care system in settings like living with a relative, with a foster family, or in a group home. These children are just waiting for a, a consistent adult to care for them. The first time I met him, he just put his arms all like this and stole my heart. According to a 2020 study from JAMA Pediatrics, nearly half of children in the foster care system had a special health care need. For children with very complex medical needs, finding a foster family can be an even greater challenge. But one couple made that their calling. Reporter Lauren Lowry shows us how. We always thought we'd have a lot of kids. In 2016, Caleb and Rochelle Bone were pregnant with the child who started it all, Griffin. All anatomy scans and everything looked great. It wasn't until after he was born that um, they heard a murmur. It was the next day that the murmur was louder and not quieter. On his second day of life, Griffin was diagnosed with Tetralogy of Fallot, a congenital heart defect affecting about one in every 2,500 babies born in the U.S. By three and a half months old, Griffin had heart surgery. The procedure was a success, but the outcome was somewhat unexpected. While we were in the hospital with Griffin, there was uh, a girl on the same floor that had some kind of heart condition, small baby, that had been left um, by her parents. Seeing a baby in the hospital with no home changed everything, and the Bones made the decision to foster. If there happens to be other kids with extra medical needs, we feel like that's something that we can offer right now. It's a calling. Great job, high five. Proud of you. 
It's kids like Maurice, who's been with the bone since 2019. Yeah. He was their second ever foster child, and now their adopted son. The Bones took in a newborn preparing for heart surgery. We can't show her face, but we can tell you her heart surgery in September at nine months old was a success. Caleb held her in his arms for their walk down Survivor Lane at the Nashville Heart Walk. It was a day of emotional celebration. But it isn't always happy outcomes. In 2022, after 13 months with The Bones, Baby Everett passed away. In total, the Bone family has taken in six children with medical complexities in the last five years, while also caring for their two biological children. A lot of people ask us how we can do it, and I think some of it is just because we choose to. When you look at a kid that has disabilities, you see the disability, you see the challenges, but you don't see all of the really great things that that kid can bring. So grateful for what our family looks like. And it looks wildly different than we would have ever <laughs> planned, but it's better. What a caring couple and a sweet family. What they're doing for these children is just amazing. Look, everyone needs to be loved and to have someone there for them. And they are stepping up and, and truly loving these kids and bringing them in their home. Very yeah. nice. All right, that's it for us at Investigate TV Plus. I'm Lee Zuri. And I'm Tisha Powell. Thanks for watching. On the next Investigate TV Plus, the price of farmland is at an all-time high, and some argue deep-pocketed investors are driving up the price. The difference with these outside investors are they don't have the same community ties, the same community attachments a farmer does. We explore what this means for rural America and the price you pay at the grocery store.